One of the greatest aspects of our faith as Catholics is the communion of the saints. Having gone before us and lived heroic lives, they offer us a path to follow and can intercede for us to the Father. Because, you know, they're already in heaven. And lucky for us, the number is always growing, with popes officially canonizing new saints each year. And it leaves us with an interesting question. How does someone become a saint? This is Catholicism in Focus. If you have aspirations of one day becoming an officially canonized saint in the Catholic Church, someone who is literally added to the list, there are a number of things that have to happen. For starters, you have to live an extraordinary life of virtue for God and others, and eventually die. I know that this is both obvious and kind of a bummer, but what does St. Paul say? If we want to live with Christ, we have to die with him as well. If you want to be in heaven, you've got to die first. And when I say die, I mean you've got to be really dead. Not almost dead. Not recently dead. I mean really, really dead. In order to begin the process of raising a cause for canonization, you have to be dead for at least five years. The idea is that enough time needs to pass to ensure that your reputation is enduring. The church doesn't want to canonize you as a virtuous and holy person, only to have people come forward a year later with stories about your college years. It just makes everyone look foolish. Of course, every rule has its exceptions, and both John Paul II and Benedict XVI waive part or all of this time to fast-track the process. With John Paul II, it was for Mother Teresa, and with Benedict, it was for John Paul II. Once the time of probation has passed, a formal cause may be raised. While anyone can petition a cause, it is up to the bishop of the diocese in which you died to formally open an investigation. If he accepts the petition, the bishop, working with a diocesan tribunal, will investigate your life. They'll examine how you lived, take testimony of living witnesses, and collect all public and personal writings you may have produced. So, yeah, watch what you post on social media. If the bishop finds your life to be filled with examples of heroic virtue, specifically how you lived out the theological virtues of faith, hope, and charity, and the cardinal virtues of prudence, justice, temperance, and fortitude, he submits the gathered information to the Vatican's Congregation for the Causes of Saints. If the congregation accepts the application, congratulations, you're moving forward and are given your first official title. For as long as your cause is open to investigation, you will be known as a servant of God. But don't get too excited just yet. It doesn't mean that you're a saint, and it doesn't come with any perks. All it really says is that there is no major impediment blocking your application, and that your case is under investigation. So, yeah. A postulator will then present for examination what is called a positio, a summary document of your cause to nine theologians, who will then vote on whether or not your life was heroic enough for veneration. If the majority agree that it was, your application goes on to the cardinals and bishops of the Congregation for the Causes of Saints, who will then make the decision whether or not to pass it on to the Pope for approval. At this point, enough people will have investigated your life and verified that you're not a heretic, that if you make it to the Pope's desk, you're basically golden. The Pope almost always accepts the recommendation of the Congregation, and when he does, you will find yourself with a new title. Venerable. In officially being declared venerable, or heroic in virtue, you won't yet have a feast day, churches won't be allowed to be dedicated in your honor, and the church will make no formal statement about your status in heaven. But you can have prayer cards made of you calling you venerable and encouraging the faithful to pray to you for a miracle. So you got that going for you. And while this might not seem particularly important, it is a major step towards being declared a saint. Since the whole process is not about making you a saint, but merely recognizing that you're already in heaven, a miracle attributed to you after your death is pretty good evidence that you're in the right place. In fact, having a miracle attributed to you posthumously is so important to the process that there is only one way you can be beatified without one. Dying as a martyr. Because really, if your public witness in standing up for the faith was ultimately what brought about your death, the church thinks that that's pretty heroic enough on its own, miracle or not. If this is the case for you, or an investigation has produced a verified miracle after your death, there's no stopping it venerable. You're going straight on to beatification as a blessed. This is where things get fun for you. Not only do you get your own holy card. As a blessed, the church will officially declare that your presence in heaven is worthy of belief. You'll be given a feast day, and the Pope will grant permission for your limited public veneration, usually in your home diocese or religious community. And for some people, that might be enough. 
Although absolute assurance has not been given and veneration is not universally permissible in the church, you'll join the ranks of the great Franciscans, Blessed John Duns Scotus and Blessed Giles. So that's nothing to sneeze at. Congratulations. But maybe that's not enough for you. Maybe you want people to have the assurance of your permanent heavenly home. Maybe you want your heroic virtue remembered by the whole church, not just your local community. Maybe you want a church dedicated in your honor. In which case, you should probably start by working on your humility because your goals are a bit off. But after you've done that, you're going to need to get busy producing another miracle. More than just declaring you as someone who lived a virtuous life or allowing limited veneration, the process of canonization is a major step for the church. In declaring you a saint, what they're essentially doing is assuring people, beyond any doubt, that you are in heaven enjoying the beatific vision. Before they do that, they're going to want to make sure that that first miracle wasn't a fluke. Because really, one miracle? That's great. Died as a martyr? Awesome. But two miracles? Died as a martyr with a miracle? Now we're talking. It is only when a second miracle has been verified, or a first for a martyr, that one can be officially canonized. Are there exceptions? You know there are. In 2014, Pope Francis canonized Pope John XXIII with only one miracle citing the fact that there were a large number of miracles under investigation, essentially saying that one of them has to be authentic. In 2012, Pope Benedict did this as well with Hildegard of Bingen in a process called equivalent canonization. In the case, the Pope recognized that veneration of the saint had been well established within the tradition, but for one reason or another, the process was never completed. And really, none of this should shock us or bother us. While some will demand more strict adherence to the rules and seek greater certainty, the fact of the matter is that the rules are human law, not divine law, have changed numerous times, and absolute certainty beyond any doubt is just something that we'll never have. For what is the purpose of canonizing saints in the first place? Is it to give us a list that is so authoritative that it proves something supernatural, essentially taking our faith away? Or is it to help us know the path to follow and to whom we should go to seek assistance? someone lives such an extraordinary life that they continue to inspire people long after their deaths, interceding for us to help our faith grow. And that's all the evidence I need. They're a saint in my book.